Today's presentation, <sighs> as noted, today's presentation, what do we have going on here? There's two things to talk about in today's world. The first thing we gotta talk about is what we think is happening in our economy. That is to say, our social narrative. Now the social narrative as of today, more or less, can be divided into this simple comment, con uh, concept. We nearly avoided a depression. We nearly avoided a recession. It's getting work worse anyways, and people are really angry about it, right? I mean, you look at the presidential election, you pick up the newspaper, and this is what you hear. This is our fundamental social narrative. Now, it, bluntly, what's actually happening our, in our economy, our economic reality, a little bit different. We have some serious problems, but by any objective measure, the overall quality of life in the US is at an all-time high level. That is the reality of things. As I go through this, I'm gonna be making that point over and over again abundantly clear. But here's the important thing. You know, this shift, this idea of thinking about stories versus reality and how they can be different, well, this is, for me has been an enormous epiphany. Because in a very real way, when you start to accept the fact that our social stories and our economic realities can diverge, the world makes a lot more sense, but it also becomes a lot scarier. Because what you start realizing is that our economy is on a way slipperier, uh, slipper, slipperly, slip, slippery, very slippery ice, I mean, I'm not sure exactly how to say that, <laughs> than you would typically understand. But with that being said, you also understand what's happened over the last 20, 30 years, much clearer as well. The world makes a lot more sense, even if it becomes, if you will, a little bit unmoored. Now, when we get right into it, the big picture, how, what has happened? Here we are, it's May of 2024, and you think about what's happened over the last 18 months, and it has been a fairly interesting turnaround from a narrative perspective. After all, it was about a year and a half ago when, of course, we were told a recession was nigh. You remember, it was gonna hit. At the beginning of 2023, a year, year and a few months ago, it was just fait accompli. The press was not talking about whether we were going to have a recession. The discussion was on how deep it was gonna be, right? How bad, how ugly is this gonna be? Now, if you were paying attention over the last year, turns out we didn't actually have a recession. And by the end of the year, Inflation started cooling off. Suddenly you started uh, seeing the stock market start to pop. Consumer confidence came back. We started hearing about multiple rate cuts from the point of the Federal Reserve, right? Pretty interesting. And then you come in to the April uh, release of the Wall Street Journal uh, forecast survey. Envy of the world. We're now, after being in a recession, 18 months later, we're envy of the world. Of course, the stock market just crashed 40,000. And if you read, of course, the adorations, all that, that, that just gushing coming out of the press, it is, of course, all due to the amazing leadership of the man at the helm of our Federal, of our federal Reserve, a guy named Jerome Powell. And as far as narratives go, this narrative, everything I just told you is about as wrong as it could possibly be. That is not what happened over the last 18 months by any stretch of the imagination. But this is nothing new, again, our narratives and our reality have become strongly uh, removed from each other. And that is probably the scariest thing of all. Now, of course, it does remind me of one of my favorite expressions in economics. An economist is an expert who will know tomorrow why the things he predicted yesterday didn't happen today, right? <laughs> by the way, that's by an economist named Lawrence Peter. And if you're wondering about that name, Peter, he is also, of course, the creator of the Peter Principle. This man was a truly, truly stellar intellect, no doubt about it. Now, if you've seen any of my talks over the course of the last year and a half, couple of years, you know I didn't buy into the recession stuff. We contribute to the Wall Street Journal uh, survey of forecasters. There is a question they ask us, what is their percent chance of a, of a recession over the course of the next year? You can see we're there along the bottom, never really saying we had any major chance. The overall average got above 60%, which was one of the highest numbers ever seen in that particular survey. In fact, the only time economists have actually said there was a 60% chance of being in a recession was when the nation was actually already in a recession. It's true, forecasters are very good at predicting recessions that are already happening, you know? Well, and that tells you a lot about the forecasting community. So what is the big picture? Um, first of all, we, there was never any risk of a hard landing. It's as simple as that. Why were we supposed to have a recession? Well, you know, because of interest rates and inflation. Interest rates were crushing real estate, inflation was crushing consumers, bam, ergo, we're gonna have to have a recession. Of course we are. But that's a complete misinterpretation of what was going on. 
We didn't have inflation and rising interest rates because, because of some exogenous shock to the system. It wasn't like a meteor landing on the US. Inflation and rising interest rates were the consequence of the excessive stimulus the Federal Reserve and Congress threw at the economy in response to the pandemic. They caused this. These were symptoms of an overheated economy, not the death knell of an economy about to go into another recession. Now, the bad news there, of course, is, well, interest rates are not going to be falling anytime in the near future. The decline in interest rates you were hearing about at the end of last year were driven on the idea that the economy was going to slow tremendously in the course of 2024. And again, that's not happening. Ergo, these rate cuts aren't going to happen. But really, when you want to think about the true problems that the Federal Reserve has created for us, created for our world, created for our economy, it's not inflation. Inflation is starting to fade away. It's the other legacies that Jerome Powell has left us, namely with enormous asset bubble, an enormous, of course, federal deficit. And when you layer on top of that, the shortage of people and labor we have, well, these are our true long run problems. But here, of course, the biggest issue is this is not really what we're talking about. As for California itself, you know, it's interesting. We're obviously in a lead up to an incredibly ugly election. And California has really found itself in the crosshairs of both parties. I'm going to dive into this. Both parties have a lot of bad things to say about California. We'll dive into that in just a little bit. But the answer is, we're not dead yet. Quite the opposite. California's economy, for all the negative rhetoric, doing pretty well. Now, there's no doubt we have some issues. Housing shortages, labor shortages. These are things holding the California economy back. What's helping the California, California economy forward? Well, that would be the parts of our state that have housing and have labor, namely the Inland Empire which is one of the reasons why the Inland Empire right now is one of the strongest economies in the state. By the way, it's one of the strongest economies in the nation. And the changes that are happening in this community right now are profound. Look, I've been studying the Inland Empire for over two decades. I've been with this community through some tough times and some great times. But right now, the changes, the underlying shifts, what is happening in this economy are truly Truly eye-opening. I'm going to dive a little bit of that. We dive into it too. But of course, the biggest issue our nation has to face is, are these narratives, these broken narratives, and the problems that are coming from all these stories we tell ourselves that are not true. I mean, right off the bat, you think about the amazing partisanship that is going on. Look, politics is the art of compromise. It's how people with two different opinions come together and find this thing called compromise. Well, the term compromise has been forgotten in Sacramento and Washington DC right now. And by the way, that's incredibly dangerous. Compromise is how democracies function. If you don't compromise, it's really hard to have a, 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 a democracy. And of course, these misguided priorities driven by false narratives are driving some really poor local policy choices. And that's true when it comes to taxes. It's true when it comes to housing. It's true when it comes to all sorts of things. But the big story of this year, of course, is going to be that insanely ugly election that's going to happen in November of this year. It's not the economy. The economy is not going to be the news this year. It's that election and how ugly it is, again, driven by false narratives. So this is the story. It's those narratives, and that's what we all have to pay attention to. So getting right into it, how are we doing? Well, 2023 was actually a good year for growth. We didn't narrowly miss a recession. Quite the opposite. The economy grew at about 2.5% over the course of the year. Good steady numbers from personal spending. Fixed investment was decent. Exports were picking up. It was a good year. And when you look at what happened at the start of this year, well, we had a little bit of a slowdown in the first quarter. But be clear, that slowdown was in output. It wasn't in consumption. We had 2.8% growth in consumption. It just that a lot of that consumption came from overseas because they had a big surge in imports. Well, that's not that big of a deal. Ultimately, demand leads supply. A little bit of a down, it's gonna bounce back forward, and indeed, the numbers for Q2 are already coming in somewhere between two and three and a half percent. Another good quarter, this expansion is gonna continue. And when you dive a little deeper into the data, you pay attention to what's going on, a little more detail. Well, take consumers, for example. We've all heard that consumers are desperately struggling with inflation, desperately struggling with rising rents, desperately struggling with rising interest rates, yet, you look at the numbers, and it looks like to me like they're desperately having fun. 
foreign travel at an all-time high level, uh, restaurant spending. Restaurant spending in nominal terms is 38% higher today than it was before the pandemic. Booze consumption, alcohol consumption is up 20% in real terms in five years. Five years, 20% increase. Now, I would tell you, the very beginning of the surge did happen in 2020. That's when we all had our booze delivered to our front door, and then we sat in the corner of our bedroom drinking ourselves to sleep at night, right? Because we were stuck inside and couldn't go anywhere. The good news is now we are out. We are getting drunk in restaurants with other people. This is a positive upside in this world. Nevada, gaming revenues, never been busier. You want to be jealous of somebody else's 10K? Take a look at Live Nation's 10K right now. This, this company made an obnoxious amount of money last year. Every single concert sold out. Every single VIP package sold out. Have you noticed, did anybody else notice that every 77-year-old rocker is slapping on the spandex for one last tour? But dude, you don't fit in that spandex. It doesn't matter. Get me on that stage, right? And you certainly see good steady numbers here in the Inland Empire. A huge surge, of course, in taxable sales locally. It has flattened out, but again, it's flattening out at a much higher level. You see an economy, not that's tipping down, but rather an economy that's cooling off from the huge overheating that occurred a couple of years ago. Same thing in the US overall. Take a look at labor markets. We continue to add over 200,000 jobs a month. Certainly not as good as it was last year, but I tell you what, it's better than it was in 2019 or 2018. And of course, overall job openings, the unemployed workers, it's cooled off. It used to be there were two job openings for everyone looking for a job. Now it's 1.4. That is still higher than at any point prior to the pandemic. And of course, with a tight labor market, we know wages tend to rise. That's absolutely the case. Real worker median earnings are growing at about 3% year over year. That's on par with what was happening prior to the pandemic. Unemployment rate, of course, remains below 4%. A lack of workers is a driving number. For all the stories of credit card debt, top line consumer debt, looks fine. You know, most consumer debt is in the form of a 30-year fixed rate mortgage, and the delinquency rates on those are still near all-time low levels. Ergo, the overall delinquency share of, of consumer debt is still near an all-time low level of about 3%. By the way, back in 2010, it was 12%. That was a distressed consumer debt market, not this one. And of course, there's almost no foreclosures. There's very few bankruptcies. Americans are not struggling. At least not overall, not in the aggregate. Now I appreciate some families always are, but on net, there are way more people who are doing better than who are doing worse. It's obvious in the data. Local employment here, of course, continues to grow. Now that's been going on for a decade. This data goes back all the way to 2014, and you can see how much more rapidly the independent empire has been growing compared to LA or Orange County. Not complicated, this is all a labor force conversation. But even since the pandemic ended, Look at the fastest growing economies in the state. Fresno, the Inland Empire, and Sacramento have all added more jobs than any of the major coastal economies. Uh, again, this is an area that's leading the economy, not lagging behind, leading the California economy and lagging behind. And if you take a look at unemployment, un it's interesting, unemployment and the Inland Empire are basically exactly the same now. They have functionally the same labor market. These economies truly are emerging. It's about a 5% unemployment rate. You can see Inland Empire job postings over there. Again, not as hot as it was a year and a half ago, but still substantially better than it was prior to the pandemic. It's an economy that continues to move forward. And with tight labor markets, wages are rising over here. You can see average weekly wages out here in the Inland Empire right now running about $1,100. Back in 2019, it was about $8,200. So we're talking about a 25% increase in average weekly earnings for your average worker. That's a great number, one of the highest growth rates in the state. Interest rates are up, we all know about that. Mortgage rates are back into the sevens, the one year and five, the 10 years and the mid fours. But with all those higher interest rates, hasn't put much of the kibosh in overall business investment. You can see data on the right-hand side, good strong numbers for manufacturing structures, software, research and development. It is true, you're going down the list a little bit, residential structural investment, a little weak. By the way, a little bit of a bounce in the first quarter, but still down from where it was back in 2019. Obviously, real estate has had a tough couple years. But even here, when you look a little closer, you start to realize that this is not the housing market we saw 15 years ago in the wake of the Great Recession. Yes, overall existing home sales are near these incredibly low levels, what we saw back in 2010. But think of this, 
no sales, mortgage rates from, from two and a half to seven and a half percent, home prices fell year over year for two months. And then they started growing. And home prices in the US are now 6% higher than they were a year ago, despite interest rates being in the 7%. And here's another little mystery. While it is true existing home sales are down, new home sales are actually doing great. They're at a 10-year high right now. And of course, with people buying new homes, builders continue to build, and single-family housing starts are running above a million units again. So boy, if this is a recession, long live the recession. Local housing market, the numbers are great. You can see prices in Riverside are above 600,000 again. San Bernardino sale about 500,000. Overall permits, a bit of a shift. You can see uh, Riverside's uh, single family cooling off just a bit, but Riverside multifamily heating up a lot. That's great news for the community. San Bernardino a little bit more flat right now. Wish we saw better numbers on that side of the county border, if you will. But nevertheless, the housing market here continues to add new stock. And as noted, towards the end of the last year, we got into the end of the year, and prices started cooling off, both in the US as well as in California. One thing on the left-hand side, California versus US inflation, exactly the same. Our prices are not going through the roof, though and where everybody else are not, that's, that's false. Um, but of course, with inflation cooling off, the University of Michigan in Consumer Sentiment Index is coming up, the S&P 500, I told you recently, you know, the numbers got above 40,000, high numbers here. I mean, how crazy it is out there, I don't know if you caught the news yesterday, Bitcoin just crossed $70,000. $70,000 for a Bitcoin. Now, if you've seen me talk before, what do I think there's a fundamental value to Bitcoin? Absolutely. That value, by the way, is called zero. Not complicated. <laughs> if you're wondering why, I would suggest a wonderful biography by an Italian-American gentleman named Charles Ponzi. <laughs> Lived a little over 100 years ago. It's a wonderful rags to riches to jail to deportation of a true American entrepreneur. Absolute wonderful story all the way around. Now, Putting this, of course, to one side, obviously, this all boils down to narratives versus reality. We were told we were going to have a recession, and instead, we had a great economy, right? And what's going on? Well, again, there is a difference between our narratives and our reality. And the positive value of Bitcoin is a great example of the power of the narrative. Why does Bitcoin have a positive value? Now, that's a good question in my mind, and I'll tell you why I think it should. But putting snark aside about, about Mr. Ponzi, uh, here's what I think. Anything that is going to be a commodity of exchange, a currency, if you will, has to have a limited quantity. It has to be limited, right? You can't have unlimited dollars because that causes inflation, right? You have to have a fixed quantity or some limited quantity of that commodity. And that's the problem with cryptocurrency. Any kid with a master's degree in computer science can make their own cryptocurrency. Ergo, if you can an infinite cryptocurrency, I have a tough time seeing how any of these can be worth anything. Now, Bitcoin had, of course, the value of being the first out there. But what about this Dogecoin nonsense, which is like $4,000 and all this other nonsense? Again, you look a little closer and you realize this doesn't make any sense. But my logic can go to, you know, go blow in the wind for, <laughs> for all these folks care. Because if I wanted to buy a Bitcoin, it's going to cost me $70,000 no matter what I think. Why? Well, go to their websites. Go to one of the crypto bros parties. Watch some of these videos. Read their literature. They have an enormous mythology wrapped around all this, this, you know, this crazy product. And they have all sorts of rationales and reasons for it. And in the midst of this cloud of what I think is nonsense, emerges real value, right? Now, you might say, oh, those Gen Z, they'll, they'll figure it out, those silly kids. But it's not just them. There's nothing unusual about this. There's another asset right now that is at an all-time high level, uh, gold. Why? Why is gold so expensive right now? It's an inflation hedge. Do you know what an inflation hedge is? Everything. Inflation is when prices go up. A chair is an inflation hedge, for God's sake, right? Because the price of a chair goes up. So the idea that a product is an inflation hedge, that's just, well, common sense. Everything is at some level. But gold's special. Why? Well, we used to use gold as, as the basis of our currency. Yeah, like 100 years ago. You know, when we rode horses to work and we were allowed to build, beat our children on a regular basis. It was a different world. <laughs> We're not going back to that world. It's not going to happen. 
Ergo, gold shouldn't have this value, but the narrative remains and the price of gold is at this ultra high level. I don't invest in that either, but yet again, there's plenty of people who do. More power to them. Just understand what you are investing in is a narrative, not a reality. Always keep that in mind. Now, the other side of it, of course, is that unsustainable federal deficit. Uh, you know the numbers, $1.8 trillion deficit right now, debt to GDP at 120%. We got Social Security and Medicare. I mean, this is a mess, but it's not part of the narrative. Why do I think that? Well, let's fast forward. You know, later this year, we're going to have that ugly election. Well, again, this ugly election, you're going to have all these people going to the booth, and they're going to pick a D or an R. They have to walk in that booth, D, R. Are they making that choice on the basis of which party has their better plan to deal with the deficit? No. There's a hundred other reasons why they're going to make that choice, and the deficit has nothing to do with it. By the way, has anybody else noticed that neither party has a plan to deal with the deficit? Why? Because we don't care. See, one of the things, it's way too easy, it's way too easy to point fingers and mock politicians and say it's all your fault. It's way too easy to point your finger at the papers and go, it's all your fault. But one thing I want you to all remember, what do papers and politicians have in common? They live, win, profit, succeed, move ahead on the basis of grabbing and selling the right narrative. If you're on stage and you're trying to be elected and you grab the wrong narrative, you're not gonna win. If you're a newspaper selling the wrong narrative, you're gonna go out of business. So in a very real sense, when politicians and papers are telling us things that are not true, recognize it's because we wanna see it. It is a function of us looking for confirmation of our own personal biases. Now, by the way, there's also that magic spot in the middle. There are the places when, of course, social narratives and economic reality overlap. My favorite example of that, of course, would be Ticketmaster. For years, these guys have been ripping us off. They're total thieves. Now, the beauty of this is it's, it's economic reality, but it's become more and more social narrative. And when social narratives and economic realities align, that's when we get good policy. And that's exactly what we just got recently when, of course, the Justice Department finally went after Ticketmaster for its clearly monopolistic tendencies in, of course, the ticket selling business. So when they do align, you get good policies. When they're not aligned, well, you see where this goes. Anyway, the point of this is that you constantly see narratives skewing our interpretation of the world, and you're skewing interpretations of news at the root of economic bubbles, driving bad policy choices, I keep talking about this book, Narrative Economics, that Robert Schiller, Nobel Prize winner, wrote a couple years ago, where he said we need to incorporate the contagion of narratives in economic theory, otherwise we remain blind to a very real mechanism for economic change. Here, here, absolute genius, absolute genius. Now, it's not new genius. You know, it's all been said before. One of my favorite philosophers, of course, a man by the name of Will Rogers, lived in Southern California. And he famously said back in the day, you might have heard this, it isn't what we don't know that gives us trouble, it's what we know that ain't so. Now what's he talking about? He's talking about false narratives. And that's what's so intriguing. You suddenly start to see these, if you will, wise men of our of decades ago talking about exactly what's going on today. They saw it, they knew it, and here it is, it's still happening today. Now, where we, how we got to this weird place all boils down, of course, to the narrative around the pandemic. We remember all that stuff, the pandemic's gonna cause a depression. Now that was nonsensical. No pandemic has ever caused a depression. I still don't know why anybody said that out loud. And indeed, you just look at the numbers. It was a scary time. We were stuck inside for a year, there's no doubt about it. it we had a 9% decline in GDP from the first to second quarter of 2020. That's off the charts. This insane blip is still screwing up all my graphs. It's really hard to do graphs with 2020 in there, right? But with all that being said, it, it was the deepest recession in history. It was the shortest. It lasted about eight weeks. By the June of 2020, the economy was running back. In the third quarter of the year, we had an 8% growth rate. By the first quarter of 2021, the economy was healed. Yet, none of that news made it anywhere into that narrative bubble called Washington, D.C. Now, I was, Steve, you were talking about out here. Again, if you'd see me, I went in the back and then I was running back. I was with Lance, the very beginning of this saying we thought it was gonna be a V. And lo and behold, that's exactly what happened. But again, narratives are powerful. The economy lost $1.2 trillion in output or income 
as a result of the pandemic. In return for being stuck inside for a year, Congress deployed six trillion dollars of fiscal stimulus. Five dollars of stimulus for every dollar of lost income. By the way, that adds up to $50,000 per household. Can you imagine? We got stuck inside for a year. You got a $50,000 check. Not bad, not bad, right? Now, mind you, uh, you know, it didn't all come from Congress. Congress could never have gotten that money. They could have never borrowed it. Where did they get it from? They wandered down the street to the formerly independent institution known as the Federal Reserve. And of that $6 trillion in stimulus, $5 trillion came directly from, of course, the Federal Reserve itself in the form of quantitative easing, which is a fancy name of saying we printed a lot of money <laughs> and gave it to everybody. Just as simple as that. Now, that, of course, caused a 40% increase in M2, one year, 25% year over year, an insane surge in money supply. Gee, not a surprise while we had inflation. But it set off something else, too, which is something we ought to keep in mind. Because that $5 trillion in brand new money got hit an economy which already had what I would call frothy financial markets. And financial markets went from frothy to insane. And you saw home prices go up, stock prices go up, uh, Bitcoin prices go up. Everything went through the roof. And that $5 trillion in brand new money turned into $35 trillion of brand new household net worth. $35 trillion. Let me give a number for you on that. That adds up to $350,000 for every single American household. That is a 35% increase in net worth for Americans. Gee, no wonder everybody went crazy. Everybody was rich, everybody had cash, and everybody spent like it. I mean, look at the numbers. While we were being told that people were being crushed by inflation, crushed by interest rates, crushed by rental prices, this is their spending from the first quarter of 2023 to the first quarter of, of, of 2020 to the first quarter of 2023. We increased our nominal spending on air 85%. The light trucks, 70%. Foreign travel, 66%. Sporting equipment supplies, this one scares me, including guns, uh, up 54%. Um, then you get to the bottom, utilities, 30%. Rent, 20%. Child care, 17%. So we, it doesn't look like we were struggling. We were spending our money on tons of stuff. And by the way, all that stuff, that has to come from somewhere. We don't make most of this. It might get assembled here, but the parts come from somewhere else, or we get everything from abroad. So remember, we had all that problem with shipping? Remember all those infrastructure problems, those logistics problems we had? Well, you know, you're going to need a bigger boat. There's way too much demand, right? This is why we had all those boats stuck off there. We just weren't prepared for this level of demand. And it's amazing to me, we all looked at those boats and go, oh, that must be COVID. Uh, boats don't catch COVID. Just so we're clear. So in the end, of course, all this demand, all that money, well, that turned into inflation. It's, 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 uh, yes, of course, it has to be. Demand plus money equals inflation. That's how it works. Inflation is the consequence of too many dollars chasing too few goods. One of the most amazing cliches, what's most amazing about this is you have yet to hear anybody from Washington, D.C., including particularly the Federal Reserve, say out loud, why do we have inflation? Because we printed too much money. No one will say that out loud. That is how bizarre this world is. Now, inflation has settled down. Quantitative tightening, things have cooled off, and, and we've settled down to a more normal pace. Uh, for example, from 22 to 23, GDP deflator grew by 5.3%. Over the last year, down to about 2.5%. But with that being said, just because inflation cooled down doesn't mean consumer spending cooled down. Quite the opposite, consumer spending continues to grow at about 3% on a year-over-year -year basis, a good, strong patterns. But people are shifting. They're spending less on goods, more on services. Take a look on the right-hand side. You can see nominal retail sales. That's for restaurants and grocery stores. Less spending in grocery stores, more going out to restaurants and getting drunk with our friends. That is the shift going on. It doesn't mean people are spending less. They're just changing their consumption pattern. And you can see, I love this graph. It tells you everything you need to know. This is Ontario Airport. And you can see uh, airport freight traffic going down. Supply chains are clearing. We're catching up. There's no big problems out there. But passenger traffic right now at Ontario Airport at a 15-year high. People are traveling more, and they're buying less stuff. That's the place we're in right now. And you see that in the shift in logistics. We know, of course, logistics is cooling off. You can see the increase in vacancy rates. Overall, employment logistics is cooling off, and that is having some impact on the Inland Empire. But with that being said, 
Um, this is not anything symbolic of an economy that's, that's cooling off. It's just an economy that's going back to what I would call a more normal platform. Overall outlook for consumers is still very, very good. After all, people still have nearly $4 trillion cash on hand sitting in their checking and savings account. $4 trillion. That is four times what it was in 2019, five years ago. People have 400% more liquid cash today. And of course, remember, most consumer debt is in the form of a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. If you haven't moved, you're in great shape. And that means the household debt service ratio, which is a percent of household income being used to support current financial obligations, is still near an all-time low level. Again, people are doing great. Yes, there has been some increase in the use of credit. Should be much of a surprise. Credit card debt starting to pop up again. But with that being said, it's not toxic. Overall debt levels are not high. What we're spending on our debt is not high. And to take a look on the right-hand side, even credit card stuff. You remember a couple months ago when credit card debt went over a trillion and all the papers lost their minds? Oh my God, it's a trillion dollars. Well, why is that different than 999 billion? Because it's got another digit, damn it. Uh, really? <laughs> another digit? That's exciting? Look, you have to scale it. You have to have context. Well, prior to the Great Recession, consumer debt was 8% of disposable income. Right now, consumer, I'm sorry, credit card debt was 8% of disposable income. Today, it's 5%. So overall levels of credit card debt are actually relatively low. They're not high. Now, I understand that this is not what you hear. This is a standard sort of thing you might hear. This came out a couple of years ago. 85% of Americans are feeling impact of inflation in day-to-day -day lives. 85%, 85%, sounds very scary. And then you go to the second bullet, a similar number, 88% said inflation had impacted their spending at restaurants. Well, stop, I just showed you the data. There has been a 38% increase in spending at restaurants. And yet, impact. hmm? I'd say that's an impact. Yeah, well, that's a positive impact, exactly right. But I'm pretty sure they mean a negative impact in this particular bullet. But that's just it. 88% said they're spending less, and yet 38% increase in spending. How do we square this? Well, one of two ways. We could imagine that the other 12% are going to restaurants a lot, or more likely, you're not getting people's reality out of this. And this is one of the things we always have to keep in mind. When you see a survey, that survey does not capture reality. It captures narratives. And yeah, people believe this. I think they do. People's stories, what they think is happening is different than what's actually happening. That's exactly what I'm talking about. So I'm not surprised about that. I think it's fairly informative. But when you see something like this, don't think it's real. Just remember that this is what people think is real. And that's a big deal. Or of course we have Gen Z, oh, boomers can't conceptualize. This college student on TikTok says older generations don't know about inflation, never had fight for jobs. Love that, right? Mm-hmm, right. This is why TikTok has to be banned, by the way. This is a single one reason, right? <laughs> anyway, but it's, it's not, it, again, don't pick on Gen Z. It's not fair. Uh, how about The Economist magazine? Can the, uh, could the inflation nightmare soon be over? The infla what nightmare? The Economist magazine, what nightmare? The fact that my BMW is stuck in a container and I can't get it for another six weeks? Is that the crisis we're talking about? What inflation nightmare has this nation been through in the last two years? I showed you the data. So again, you start hearing this over and over, and it's so disconnected. But yet again, the power of the narrative. How, how do we get so pulled far astray? Well, this is you know, stuff I've been adding in over the last couple of years. A wonderful, wonderful book, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. He just passed, by the way, won the Nobel Prize in Economics. A guy whose entire career was studying psychology, Nobel Prize in Economics. Why? Because his insight into human decision making was off the charts. And in particular, what he postulated in all his work is that people have two ways of thinking, type one and type two. And very quickly, it's the way to think about it. Your type one system, that's your old fashioned system. That's your lizard brain. That's basically what got you to the point that, you know, we become human beings. But then when you think about humans and where we've gone beyond, well, it's our type two thinking. And our type two thinking, that's our modern digital brain. That's the part of our head that, of course, is incredibly smart, that can figure things out at a level we've never 
experienced before across this entire planet. I mean, we, we can unwind the, the mysteries of the atom and, and the age of the universe and create these incredible computers all on the basis of the knowledge we've created using our type two system. So type two is incredibly powerful, but it's also, well, it's hard to use. Think about how hard it is to think, right? I mean, you get a couple hours in front of the computer, you're exhausted and you can't think hard about more than one thing at one time. We're, we're a one track system, right? In a multi-track world. And so if your type one system, if it's tired or busy, you're relying on type one. And that's the key. Type one system is wonderful. It's fast, it's instinctive, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's just very, very quick. And it should be. Remember, your type one system was designed primarily to prevent you from being eaten. Right? It was designed that you can make rapid decisions under limited information. I hear a rustling in the bush, run. After you run, turn around and figure out what it was. You see, that's how it works. Now, the key of course is because it's fast, because it's instinctual, because it takes these shortcuts, it also has any number of what we would call cognitive biases. Now, cognitive bias is just a fancy way of saying that we bias the information. And the easiest way of seeing this is with an optical illusion, which is a form of a, cognitive, of a cognitive bias. Are these horizontal lines parallel? Well, I'm, if you look, and you just look normally, just don't blink or anything, don't think too hard, you go, no, those horizontal lines are not parallel. But of course, you know the story here, they are parallel. Why don't they look parallel? Well, your eyes have a special mechanism that allows your two-dimensional image to be converted into a little bit of a three-dimensional image, to give you a little bit of depth perception, which again, remember, we're trying to avoid being eaten. Depth perception is very important for understanding how far that tiger is from you, right? So with that being said, you create these shortcuts to create some level of depth perception, but with that being said, when you have this kind of shading, it fools that system and suddenly it looks like those lines are not parallel anymore. That is a version of cognitive bias. Now think about this sort of system playing a role in warping everything that comes into your head and how we just make fast instinctual decisions often based on, well, on not a full, if you will, calculation of all the costs and benefits of what's really happening. We don't think as much as we think we think is the way to say this out loud. And by the way, if you're wondering here, this is a bunch of people going up an escalator into a 24 hour fitness, <laughs> my point. <laughs> Now, of course, it, uh, right, uh, the Jonathan Haidt writes this great book called The Righteous Mind where he goes into this at, at some left, but it boils down really to this. You know, when you think about the rider as the intellect and you think about the elephant as your emotions, that type one system. And the real key here is to remember that while you like to think your rational brain is in charge, it's not. It's as simple as that. Your emotional type one system is the, well, it's the elephant in the room. It is in control. And while you think you can get the elephant to go A or B, the reality is, is the elephant decides, I don't wanna do that, I'm gonna go over there. The rider has very little control over that. And in fact, what's scary, if you read Daniel Kahneman's book, you will see how often we engage in what we call post hoc rationalization, where your type two system, your smart system, literally invents reasons for why you did what you just did. And it's really kind of creepy when you get into it, right? But yet again, where are we, what happens? Well, every time you turn around, everybody's talking about how bad everything is. And if you're not consciously looking at every one of these data points they're tossing at you, yeah, it gets in your head. It does, you can't help it. And this, this survey just came out, and I love this. It tells me everything I need to know. They, this is a survey from the Federal Reserve, and the, the top line is they ask people about their own personal well-being. This goes back to 2017. Personal well-being hasn't changed a bit. We all feel great, we're fine, but look at our views of the rest of the world. Everybody thinks everything else is terrible. Everybody thinks, I'm doing great, but other people are really suffering. But that's what everybody thinks. That doesn't make any sense. So we're all actually doing better, but we've all been convinced that things are worse. And there's no better example of this than considering housing. What are we hearing right now? Housing, more unaffordable, 99% of the United States. Oh my God, housing is gonna crash. Housing market is so expensive. Income would jump 55% to make housing affordable. Oh my God, right? Well, let's take a little look at what's actually going on here. On the left-hand side is a very simplistic form of affordability. Imagine you bought a house 
and you use 100% LTV, what is your annual payment for the mortgage, some insurance, and some taxes put in? And, and then you compare that to the median income of a household in the United States. That's what that is. And by the way, what's really interesting here, take a look, what, you, what do you see? You see, sure, um, across the 90s into the Great Recession, and then suddenly there's a big collapse coming into post-Great Recession. What happened post-Great Recession? Prices fell, interest rates came down, and actually for that decade prior to the pandemic, housing was the cheapest it had ever been. Now, it has gotten less affordable the last couple of years. We, don't, we know about that. Why? Mortgage rates from 2.5%, 7.5%. But remember, remember that in 2019, housing was affordable as it had ever been. Now, what's interesting here is not only was it affordable, we weren't building anything. Even housing construction was relatively weak. What was happening, of course? Well, let's go back to 2019. Well, in 2019, these are some headlines that I was dealing with. I was with Lance back in 2019 when we didn't, weren't even talking about the pandemic. What were we talking about? All right, the big real estate crash that was about to occur and the recession that was gonna cause. Do you remember the big recession call of 2019? And I still remember in 2019 looking at those real estate markets and how unbelievably cold they were. Even though I couldn't figure it out. Because look, I don't care what the narrative is, the fundamentals for housing are amazing. Well, what's going on? The power of the narrative. All these people picked up the paper and they read prices were gonna fall. Well, who's gonna buy a house if prices are about to fall? So everybody's sitting on the sidelines waiting for prices to fall. But of course prices weren't gonna fall. Of course they weren't. Market was incredibly cheap and a wonderful equilibrium. It was very affordable, had great fundamentals. Why would prices fall? They didn't. But the market got colder and colder because everybody was waiting for it. And that's the power of the narrative. By the way, you think about that. Why was housing so cheap in 2019? Because everybody was told they shouldn't buy. And that's why we didn't build. So we had this bizarre housing market in 2019 that was incredibly affordable, but we told everybody it was incredibly expensive, and because they weren't buying and we weren't building, and this bizarre narrative-driven equilibrium got blown up in about late, about the third quarter of 2020. Because that's when the combinations of insanely cheap interest rates, a combination of piles and piles of cash sitting in people's checking account, the fact that being stuck inside with your family for six months made you realize you don't love your family nearly as much as you thought you did, <laughs> all led, of course, to one of the most explosive housing markets we'd ever seen in my entire life. Everyone out, like the first weekend in August, to go, yes, yeah, let's, let's go look for a house. There's an open house, we'll go look for it. And they walked around the corner, we'll go look at the open house, and they see a line of 700 people who had exactly that same idea that morning. Cue, of course, the absolute chaos. 50% increase in prices in two years. Two years! It's faster than anything we saw in the run after the Great Recession. Now, of course, the party was rocking and rolling until the Fed stomped on the brake, interest rates shot up, and the market went flat because suddenly it became very expensive. But the market didn't collapse, of course not. $30 trillion of household equity, twice as much as in 2008, over three times as much as in 2014. Piles of equity. Mortgage payments, because everybody refied at the incredibly low level, low as ever. This market isn't gonna collapse. In fact, the real problem here is that you have too many people with low interest rate mortgages. Anybody who chooses to move today has to refinance at a substantially higher rate, and that is a game changer for lots of people. You just can't do it. So when you look at the market, you realize how cold it is. There's no listings. There's no vacancies because they haven't been building. In 2010, the problem in the real estate market was we didn't have enough buyers. In 2024, the problem is we don't have enough sellers. But of course, the lack of sellers is exactly what's causing prices to go up because anything that comes online just gets snapped up because there is nothing to buy. Now, existing inventories are growing in some parts of the nation. Pay attention, this is really interesting. You know what real estate market's having a problem right now? Texas and of course, Florida. Why Texas and Florida? Well, in Texas and Florida, they had bigger home price increases. And by the way, in Texas and Florida, your income taxes are proportionate to the value of your house. And your insurance payments are going up just as much as they are in California. But unlike in California, where they restrict the increase in insurance costs, which throw us all into the government pool, in Texas and in Florida, you don't have that protection. And so suddenly, while your interest rate, your interest payments aren't going up, the cost of owning that home is going through the roof, and they are starting to struggle. California, we're not having that issue. Our problem in California is there's still not enough sellers. Now, 
It's interesting here, does that mean tell people not to buy? Well again, I'm gonna go back to that narrative versus reality. And this is one, this, I just got this from Gallup, and pay attention to this. That for people in general, do you think now is a good time or a bad time to buy? Not surprising, most people think it is a bad time to buy. Only 21% think it's a good time to buy. That's the lowest ever seen on this Gallup poll. But I want you to also point something else. In 2024 is 2021. Um, go back to 1984, or even 1994, and in 1994, 68% said it was a good time to buy. Affordability was worse in 1994 than it is today. So even here, people are still wildly too pessimistic about housing. Housing was never cheap. It was never an easy leap. Anybody who's 30 is sitting around complaining about the price of their house, explain to them, housing was never easy to buy. It was always a giant step in every family's life. When did we ever start imagining that any 25-year-old could go out and buy a house and it was just cheap? But this is the bazaar we were created for ourselves. The real issue in our nation, of course, is not, if you will, a problem with housing affordability, but a problem with a lack of people. And this we already talked about. Uh, remember that very high job opening and employment worker rate. Now, it isn't that people aren't working. The precipitation rates for people 25 to 54 are at a 30 year high. The real problem is, well, we don't have a lot of labor force growth. Labor force growth has collapsed over the last 40 years. Why? Well, population growth has collapsed as well. Take a look at the population of 25 to 34 year olds. Good steady growth from 1968 to 2004, and at that point in time, it basically went flat. Why do we run out of 25 to 54 year olds? Well, we stopped having babies about 20 years earlier. The big decline, of course, in birth rates we saw starting uh, going back a few years, of course, inevitably created a situation by which our population pyramid has turned into a population column, and lo and behold, of course, we are now starting to run out of people who can work, who could be in that labor force. This is a big issue. It's a big issue because if you want economic growth, you need more workers. It's a big issue because if you want to get your Social Security and Medicare in 25 years, we got to have more taxpayers. So this is kind of an important issue. Now, the backside of this, of course, is migration. And migration has picked up. It's usually been running about a million people a year. All right? It did cool off under the Trump administration for not too much of a surprise, but it's bounced back according to the official numbers from the census. We're getting, yet again, about a million people a year. But what's just interesting here is actually this number seems to be wrong. The census does the best they can with the estimates they have, but they limit themselves. The CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, their economists, however, are able to go more far afield. And they've been coming up with their own estimates of night migration, and they look substantially higher. According to the CBO right now, there's about over 3 million people a year coming to the United States. So when you start talking about that border crisis, it's the real deal. There are an enormous number of people coming over right now. It is not an exaggeration. There are a ton of people coming here. But I want to go to the next step. We need people. Now, I, approve, I, I, I agree completely that can you run across a desert? Not a good immigration policy. Not what I would call a substantial way of controlling the flow of people into this nation. But then again, we don't give them a lot of choice. Our legal system is utterly broken. It was broken in the late 1980s under the Reagan administration. And here we are 40 years later, and we have yet to fix it when we desperately need people. So I'm torn. I don't think we should have piles and piles, millions of people coming over the border in an uncontrolled way. I do think we should have millions of people coming into this nation in a controlled way, but we haven't provided that pathway. And you take a look what's happening. We keep adding more payroll jobs than household jobs. How is that possible? Household jobs, the estimate, is based on the census estimate of population, which is low because they're not counting for the net migration. The payroll numbers are real. That's all these workers who are filling jobs. The economy is roaring. Immigration is a key reason. And by the way, we also see it in the classrooms because a lot of public school systems are seeing all sorts of kids show up that they have to deal with. So these people are here. They're clearly driving jobs. They're driving spending. They're driving the economy. But we don't know much about them. Now, ultimately, from a long run standpoint, you know, a few years ago I was using this to cure for secular stagnation. And it is worth noting that a number of years ago, a bunch of congressional and CBO economists yet again said, how do you want to make the economy grow faster? More people. It's not complicated. They said this out loud. Of course, they also said reform the income tax code. That hasn't happened. Increase the social security age. That hasn't happened. And reduce deficits. We've gone the exact opposite on that. So here is a lot of smart words that were completely lost in the policy narratives that have been 
running around our economy in the last decade. And of course, now we're turning against it. Uh, immigration named top US problem for third straight month. I kind of disagree. And of course, uh, it, we know that both parties are now turning against immigration in the run up to this ugly election. Now I get it. This is the narrative. You have to lean into that. But if you take a step back and recognize the broader situation, you realize the reality of this is a lot more complicated. We need people. This is the wrong way of getting them. But again, we haven't given other, those people a lot of choice. Now, there's another upside, of course, to tight labor markets, which is, of course, is good for workers, particularly as it turns out low for, good for low-skill workers. Not that you've heard that. This is a, a standard article. This just came out a couple weeks ago from The Atlantic, a baffling academic feud over income inequality. Everybody knows that inequality has gotten out of hand. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows that. Well, they might know that, except for, of course, it's not actually true. On the left-hand side, this is the quartile and the highest and lowest quartile in the wage distribution. And for the last decade, the bottom quartile of earners have seen more earning growth than the top quartile earners. For the last decade, we've seen declining income inequality. Not rising, declining. Has anybody seen that story in the New York Times? Anyone? Anyone? Right? On the right-hand side, this is a share of US population in poverty, record low level. Yes or no, I don't actually think that everybody knows income inequality is growing. It's a problem, except for, of course, it's been accepted as truth by the narrative. In fact, even at a global level, this just came out not too long ago, global inequality is at 150-year low. So actually, inequality is not the screaming issue of the day. Well, how about young people? We know they're suffering. You know, this guy, uh, uh, Scott Galloway, does this blog called No Mercy, No Malice. I used to like it. And then a couple weeks ago, he, he put this out there. Now, breach of contract. We've broken the social contract that binds America. Work hard, play by the rules, and you'll be better off than your parents. For the first time in our nation's history, work with us. This is no longer true. Today's 25-year-olds make less than their parents and grandparents at the same age, yet they carry student debt loads unimaginable to previous destinations. Really, really, Scott. Now, this is a professor at NYU, for God's sake. So, Scott, let me ask you a question. You're saying a 25-year-old day today has a worse standard of living than a 25-year-old in 1974. That is what he's saying out loud. <coughs> Work with me. 25-year-olds in 1974, 25-year-olds in 2024. Really? You think that? In 1974, when our cities were full of leaded fumes that were making people crazy, the crime rate was five times higher than it was today. In the 1970s, when we had OPEC embargoes and we had to, to line up to get gasoline. In the 1970s, when we were struggling with the collapse of Vietnam and the Nixon situation. That 1970s, people had a great standard of living. In 1974, when we had to listen to disco, for God's sake. That 1970s? Are you kidding me? It's just nonsensical. And again, you look at the data, it's not true. Real incomes have been growing, more so for women than men, but even for men, the numbers are coming up. People's incomes aren't falling in any economic sense. And by the way, uh, participation rates, again, 30-year high, even real median net worth. 35 to 44-year-olds today, according to the Survey of Consumer Finances from the Federal Reserve, 35 to 44-year-olds today have the highest net worth of any group of 35 to 44-year-olds since 1989. Where is the student loan debt crisis you talk of? Now, mind you, they're not doing as well as the boomers, and that's the problem. That's the problem. It's comparative. It's not absolute. Of course they're doing better, but they feel like, well, you know, these boomers have two houses. I should, too. It doesn't work like that. You'll get there. You have to work hard. I'm sorry, what is that? Anyway. <laughs> but it isn't just that. Other quality of life metrics. Uh, life expectancy is up. Infant mortality is down. Crime rates are down. Poverty rates are down. And even this, put all this to one side. How about a, a modern smartphone? Instantaneous communication with anybody in the world. Infinite entertainment. Infinite information. Yeah, this was a smartphone when I was a kid. You remember those? <laughs> right? Right? Or, you know, how about a, a fancy flat screen TV today? Remember this thing? When I, that's what I used to watch when I was a kid. Four channels, and if you wanted to watch Doctor Who, you had to stay up to two o'clock in the morning. Now you just stream every single version of Doctor Who ever possibly made in one three-day Labor Day weekend of chaos. 
right? I eat cars today. I mean, mine blew up when I was a kid, right? You didn't have to fix them. They just blew up. Today, look at these cars that are made. Oh, uh, never mind. Anyway, look at these cars today. They're unbelievable, right? We don't even talk about this. Even dieting, how hard dieting used to be, right? Now you get a damn shot, you lose weight. It's easy. <laughs> now, be that as it may, folks, look out there. People are miserable. Anxiety, depression. Do you know how many kids in middle school and high school are on pharmaceuticals? Suicide rates, self-harm rates are all up. Kids are miserable. It's not the economy. It's the narrative. Read this book, Jonathan Hyde, Anxious Generation. Came out a couple of months ago. Mind-blowing. If you know any kid under the age of 10, you must read this book. It is insane because it goes through all the things we think we are doing to help our kids are making them fragile. And they get into the real world and they can't deal with it. And you know what's interesting? He wrote this book. It's clear what's going on, what we're doing, how we're doing it. And a bunch of people writing op-eds going, you don't know what you're talking about. Kids today are so upset because the world's terrible, because of inequality and global warming. And he's like, oh, come on, people, really? There's always been stress points in the world. Today, not that many. How about our fair state? How are we doing, right? Well, it depends on who you ask. Uh, according to the right, our nation is a mess. Our state's a mess. We are a failing economy because of our socialist policies, taxes, regulations, driving businesses and peel out of the state. Failing, we're a failing state, there's no doubt about it. Now, you talk to the left, by the way, they say the same thing. We are a failing state. We're a state that's failing our population. Screaming inequality, rents that are crushing households, uh, uh, rapacious corporations, stealing workers' wages. Hey, I, I, wow, right? So according to the right, we're a socialist hellhole. According to the left, we're a capitalist hellhole. How about the governor? What does he think? Oh, it's fine. Everything's fine. No problem here. Move along. Nothing to see. It's great. Don't worry about it. Hey, vote for me in four years. Now, by the way, if I had to figure out which one of these is right, well, actually, believe it or not, most to the truth is the governor. We are neither a capitalist hellhole, nor are we a socialist hellhole. Those, are, of course, are preposterous exaggerations. Now, I know our job growth hasn't grown quite as much as other places have. You know, just take a look at the data, Arizona, Texas, way in front of us. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, keep something in mind. Real GDP growing faster here than the rest of the nation. Uh, per, per capita incomes? growing faster in California than the rest of the nation. Oh, by the way, I also point out that our inflation rate is actually the same, so that's, that's real as well as nominal. Unemployment rates here, drifting up just a little bit, but overall job openings rate, still above where it was, coming down with everybody else, doesn't look a lot different here. Of course, this is all a story about people. Labor force, our labor force hasn't grown, Texas and Arizona has, that's a function of housing supply. Simple as that. You want more workers in California? Build more housing. And that's the one thing we've absolutely failed to do. Now, the inland parts of the state are much better than this than the coastal parts are, which is exactly why Stockton, the Inland Empire, Fresno, Bakersfield, Modesto, Sacramento, these are the most rapidly growing parts of the state. The only coastal economy in that list, San Diego, and yes, San Diego is the one enlightened coastal economy, which is building multifamily. They're doing a hell of a job. And what's interesting is even with the building going on, you're still shortage of labor. We know about logistics, how that's cooled off just a little bit, but you know what? For every job lost in logistics, immediately got snapped up in some other part of the economy. The unemployment rate is still low. Healthcare, government, construction, education, places that were struggling dealing with the huge surge in demand for warehouse workers are now able to man up a little bit better because the, because the industrial uh, real estate sector is cooling off a bit. So it's fine. It's just to transition the economy, obviously, it's fine. And of course, here we are with a small family business uh, uh, center meets, and I'd be remiss without talking a little bit about some of the small businesses here. This isn't small family business, but some data we grabbed. And you can see how important small business is to the Inland Empire. I think we're gonna be doing some work with the university on this. We've done some work in Riverside on this particular issue. And certainly when you look at SBA loans in the area, you can see how that flow is still going here. So small businesses doing all right out here in, in, of course, the Inland Empire. The big thing, of course, to worry about is our population declines. Because, you know, if we're short of workers and short of housing, what about these people who are leaving, right? Well, on that particular front, yet again, a little bit of a different story. It is true, population has gone down, there's no doubt about it. But look a little closer, and let's grab, well, let's grab the verb first. 
When you hear about this story about population declines, what do you hear? People are fleeing the state of California, fleeing. Quick question, if people are fleeing, what happens to housing vacancy rates? They go up, right? You're in Miami, there's a class six hurricane about to hit Miami, what's happening to the housing vacancy rates in Miami? They're going up, right? Fleeing implies higher vacancies. Turns out, housing vacancy in California never been lower than it is right now, huh? Well, look a little closer. Turns out we have fewer people, we have more households. Are you trying to wrap me up over there with that? Okay, okay, you let me know. You start throwing stuff, we need to meet you. More households, fewer people as the case may be. Let me repeat that. More households, fewer people. What's really happening in California, of course, is we have a decline in people per household. This is the fundamental story of our, of our population. Now, why are people spreading out? Why are people per household falling? That is a sign of prosperity. This is a sign of wealth. I, I, I like to say, what are the three worst things any human being can live with? The answer is cockroaches, bed bugs, and anybody you're not related to, okay? <laughs> and even the ones you're related to, pretty close, all right? So as soon as you have the wherewithal, you spread out. But that's the key. When people spread out in a housing-constrained economy, prices go up, that's the limitation factor, and as a result of prices going up, you squeeze somebody out. And where do they go? Well, they might have to leave the state and move to Arizona and Nevada. They might have to move the county and move from, of course, LA to the Inland Empire, which is a big part of the population growth in this part of the world. Or they end up in the alley. Growing homelessness is a function of housing shortages, not housing affordability. It's because all those flop houses those folks used to live in are now being condoized, and they're being forced into the street. But you know, they don't think that. What they think, the narrative is, homelessness is a function of all renters doing terrible, ergo we have to have eviction moratoriums, and rent control, and affordable housing mandates. But when you realize that it's a function of the prosperity of the majority of renters, you immediately realize that rent control, eviction moratoriums, and affordable housing mandates make the situation worse. Homelessness is not getting better. Why? Because the policies they are using are wrong. They're based on the wrong causal story. These people have problems they need to be dealt with as people to fix their problems. Then you get them into housing. So anyway, you solve this, but this housing first approach will inevitably fail and we're just gonna piss away more, more billions of dollars getting nowhere because the narrative is wrong. Now, mind you, we have a big skill shift. This is part of it as well. Because of high housing costs, lower skilled, lower income families move out, higher skilled ones move in. Look at the dramatic change in educational attainment in the state. Of course, you look at the labor force out here in the Inland Empire, yet again, growing much more fast, but it isn't just the overall size of the labor force. Take a look on the right-hand side. Look at the change, the 10-year change. For example, in Riverside and San Bernardino, there's been a 43 and a 37% increase in the number of people with bachelor's degrees in the Inland Empire. This economy is rapidly transitioning rapidly transitioning from the older blue collar communities it once was to something much more like the coastal communities. This is a monumental change in the Inland Empire. And fewer people are commuting as well. So more of these folks are working here. Incomes are going up like nobody's business. And by the way, that's true across the board. In fact, poverty rate in California, all time low level. Household incomes in the state, all time high level, higher than any place else in the United States by the greatest gap ever. This nation's on fire, this state's on fire. And yet, what do you see? Nearly a third of Californians are living in poverty. Wow, a third of Californians living in poverty. I call PPIC and I ask them, what, where did this come from? How did you come up, it's at a record low level. How did you come up with a third? Oh, you know, we raised the number. What? Yeah, we just made the poverty rate higher. You can't do that. <laughs> that's, not, that's not telling their reality. That's creating a narrative out of thin air. You're scaring people for no reason. But, you know, what have they, this, what have they done? They cranked up the minimum wage like crazy. And, you know, we have now have a $20 an hour minimum wage in restaurants. By the way, there was a center just up the street here who told you what was gonna happen if they, uh, you know, did all this minimum wage stuff. I don't know if you knew that center, right? Used to be around, not anymore. And guess what? $20 minimum wage, 
food prices going through the roof in our fast food restaurants, there are consequences of the choices we are making. And the biggest consequence is not that your Big Mac costs more. I don't care that much about that. You know what I care about? I care about kids. Because let's go back real quick to that increase in the unemployment rate we're seeing in the state. By the way, why are we seeing an increase in the unemployment rate? Well, the knee-jerk reaction, well, it's because of it's the tech problems. It's because of the Hollywood layoffs. It's because of our failing economy. Well, there's one problem with those stories. Initial claims for unemployment insurance are at an all-time low level. So why do we have an increase in unemployment? Well, it turns out it's unemployment for people who don't have unemployment insurance. It's for teenagers. The big increase in unemployment is for young people. Why? Well, you know, we wrote a paper over there at, the, at, that, at our center we used to have about this as well. We did it for the Restaurant Association. We pointed out that when you crank up the minimum wage, it isn't just that you do, do reduce the overall demand for work. You also bias who employers want to hire, right? If I'm going to have to pay somebody $20 an hour, I want an adult. I'm not going to get a kid who may or may not show up on a particular day who's going to be gone in three months. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to get an adult. Well, this is a real problem because kids need work experience. There's numerous studies out there that talk about how important it is to get work education. To have, I'm sorry, work experience when you're young. It increases life success almost as much as getting a college degree. It's enormously important. And yet here we are trying to fix a problem that doesn't exist and we are taking job opportunities away from the very people who need it more than anybody else. This is when you cross a line. It isn't just about a more expensive Big Mac. It's now about hurting a generation of kids. It has gone too far. It needs to stop. Good luck, not with this narrative. And of course, when you talk about the state, it's housing supply, and yet again, they have failed miserably to fix this. Housing supply, is, we're still growing 120,000 permits per year. What happened to the three million units promised by this administration? Nowhere to be seen. It's not affordability. And yet, rent control. That's the big thing coming this November. Another insane narrative. Uh, hopefully this will go down. Even rational folks in the Democratic Party are saying this is wrong. I hope this thing dies because, man, you talk about going the wrong direction, right? Now, of course, the Fed, their narratives are completely out to lunch. Oh, inflation was caused by an exogenous drop. It's now driven by inflation. Inflation is causing harm to American households. Ergo, the Fed has to fight inflation. And that's what they're doing. They're fighting inflation, right? Oh, we got to get this behind us one way or the other. Now, it, it's not that. I mean, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. You know, uh, uh, Milton Friedman said it perfectly. It is a monetary phenomenon. Why did we have inflation? Because the Federal Reserve caused us to have inflation. Now, you heard about these rate cuts. There was never going to be a rate cut. The rate cuts they were talking about were based on the idea that the economy was going to slow down this year. It's not going to slow down. There's not going to be any rate cuts. He went on 60 Minutes. There's not going to be any rate cuts. One of the, one of the greatest, silliest narratives. Narratives just don't come out of policymakers. They also come out of the financial markets. And their big narrative, I've never seen anything like it. There was never going to be four rate cuts this year. I, I was doubting we were going to have one. But you know, hey, throw a good narrative in the paper, watch the market spike, good for the stockbrokers. So play with it, right? Well, now we're coming around to the reality of things. And remember, it's not even, even if they did cut rates, it wouldn't matter. Because the real game here is quantitative tightening. Now, what's quantitative tightening? Quantitative tightening is the opposite of quantitative easing. Five trillion dollars in, since that point in time, one and a half trillion dollars has been taken out of the couch by taking assets off their books and selling them and getting rid of the cash. They pill, pulled the trillion and a half dollars out of the money supply, which is, was, it would have been much better had they just not put it in the first place, okay? But I acknowledge at least like they're trying to get it out now, but those horses are out of the barn. It's hard to get them back in. Remember, money supply is shrinking, but asset prices aren't. So that's one of the bigger issues. Look, even if they actually cut interest rates at the short end, remember, we have an inverted yield curve right now. The only thing you end up doing is inverting the yield curve. Long run rates are not going anywhere. Mortgage rates in the sevens, get used to it. It is not changing, period. Now, of course, the real legacy besides inflation, well, it's that enormous deficit that we talked about already, $1.8 trillion. The real story is, you know, you go to the run up to the Great Recession, it was all consumer debt, no government debt. And since that point in time, in 20 years, look at the difference. 
Public consumer debt down, public debt up. What, what did we actually do in the, after the Great Recession? The only thing we did was swap public debt for private debt. Called it a day. Well, no, our nation still has too much debt. And that, of course, brings me to the other part of this. The real issue, high asset prices, too much stimulus from the federal government, asset prices are insanely high right now, and that is encouraging the beginnings of excessive spending on the part of consumers. Savings rates are now bound below 4%. That's where we were in the run-up to the Great Recession. You can see the current account deficit starting to widen again. So we're not out of this mess. Where do asset markets go? Where does overspending go? Could consumer debt start to get into dangerous territory? All these things are possible, but they're not possible in the next couple of years. The best part of my job is you have to keep coming back to my event every single year <laughs> to find out where this thing's going. But at least for the next couple of years, you don't have to worry about it. Now, that of course brings me to my last point, which is the presidential election. And this is an ugly one, but you know, who's right, who's wrong? Here are two headlines. One presidential candidate, the United States is a failing nation, descending into a cesspool of ruin. In many ways, we're living in hell right now. Let's do a little poll. Who thinks that's Biden? Biden, anyone? No, 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 actually it's Trump, as it turns out. That's Trump, yep, yep. The second one, to the other candidate, America's coming back, our future is brighter, the American people are writing the greatest comeback story ever told. Now, in other words, one of these candidates is telling us we're going deep into the woods, and the other one says, no, no, we're coming out of the woods. So who's right? Who should I vote for? Well, I got bad news. They're both wrong, because we were never in the woods. Never there. We've been out of the woods all along, people. Things are just fine. It's just fine. The economy's gonna continue to grow. Lots of consumer demand. It's fine. California, we're just missing the point. We're not failing, we're missing the point. It's housing supply, not affordability. We desperately need revenue for it. We have to upskill our workers, not up-pay them. As for housing demand, it's a weird market. Lots of demand, but not a lot of liquidity. If you're a home builder, this is a high-risk, high-reward market. If you build the right stuff in the right place, you're gonna sell like crazy. You build the wrong thing, or you build in the wrong place, you're gonna have a tough time. So it's a very interesting time, but housing is not, if you will, a train wreck. It's just an interesting mar market to navigate. But of course, the real issue is the narrative is running amok, and it's leaving political chaos in its wake. Our forecast is remarkably boring. This year, last year, next year, this year. Honestly, that's it. <laughs> but with that being said, when does the narrative change? And on this one, the answer is I have no idea. Narratives are sticky. Why? Why can't people get away from these narratives? Well, Jonathan Haidt, yet again, gave us a good clue on this. In this book, Righteous Mind, where in this book he notes that people are 90% primate, 10% B. 90% primate, we get that. 10% B, what does that come from? Well, when it comes to the animal community, the champions, the absolute champions of social cooperation Ants, bees, human beings. We do it like naked mole rats. They're pretty good too, I'm told. Don't ask me why. But those are the three champions. Why us? Yeah, bees and ants get along because they're all related. That's how they work. Those, those colonies are all sisters, right? How do we do it? The answer is culture. And when you say the word culture, what you're saying is narratives. It is our common narratives that bind us. But that's the danger. When a false narrative becomes the thing that binds us, then we have a dangerous, dangerous situation. Income inequality and wealth inequality are falling in the state of California. I should go to Sacramento and they should be thrilled to hear that news because they are obsessed with the issue of inequality. They don't get happy. I go there, they throw chairs at me. Why? They don't hear me giving them good news, they hear me attacking who they are. And that is the dangerous, that is why it's so hard to get out of this particular place. That's what Mark Twain said, it is easier to fool people than to convince them they have been fooled. So, with that being said, avoid the weapons of mass distraction. I will be back here at the end of today to do a little Q&A with the rest of our speakers. And with that being said, I will turn it back over to our wonderful host for the next session. We're a little behind, I apologize. You're but. fine.